Hi, I'm Chris Bacon, uh, Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Sciences from Santa Clara University and a co-founder of the Environmental Justice and Common Good Initiative uh, rooted at the same institute. I'm honored to be here as part of the Prophetic Resilience uh, Ignatian Family Teach-In for Justice. And um, today I'm gonna talk about community-based research to build back more just and equitable food systems. I'll start by uh, going through a little bit about global food and security challenges and how it's been exacerbated by COVID-19 and then narrow in on two specific case studies of, um, the, of partnership with fair trade um, farmer co-ops in, in Nicaragua responding to these multiple hazards and also a food justice partnership um, that, that I think has some potential innovative, potentially innovative model responding to COVID-19 hunger in Northern California. Um, throughout this, we'll be thinking about building partnerships that are rooted in power with and not power over, as was so aptly put in this post from the Ignatian Solidarity Network series um, by Anna Robertson. And finally, we'll come back in terms of thinking about what can be done. What are some of the lessons learned from these experiences and how can we use this to inform reinvigorated partnerships uh, for food justice and, and broader um, resilience moving forward. So there's lots of ways of framing the issues of our global food system. Um, we know that historically for millennium and millennium, you know, 13, 15,000 years, more, even more, the, the rich diversity of, of diets and, and people's relationship to plants and food um, has continued. There's been dramatic changes in the last 150 years as we've seen the sort of mechanization and specialization in our food systems, a, a larger quantities of food than ever been produced. And this classic sort of diagram of the, of the tractors in the fields uh, as kind of epitomizing for some the mark of progress, but with that progress, we've often seen unanticipated uh, consequences. And we've seen to, to some extent a move from diversity to uniformity within our food systems. Here's a, a diagram that was compiled several years ago by the National Geographic based on data about commercially available seed varieties in the United States. And what you see on the top here is that, you know, by an eight, in 1903, for example, there was about 463 varieties of radishes that were available in commercial seed houses. Many of these were small scale seed houses growing out with sort of local networks or regional networks of growers. By 1983, 80 years later, there were only 27 varieties of uh, radish available in these commercial houses. We see a similar pattern with tomatoes, 408 to, to 79, right? And so this shows a dramatic sort of move to uniformity, not just in some of the agricultural practices as high input mechanized agriculture became the norm in many places, but also in the varieties of crops that were used and even some of the diets that were consumed. Let's just fast forward all the way up through, you know, this is um, a, a key article that was published in 2017 um, by some of the integrative environment and agricultural researchers. And they're taking here this notion of uh, planetary limits where we um, that's been developed by a number of environmental and climate scientists and they're identifying these places when we have seemed to be exceeding the capacity of the earth our water systems or the atmosphere to deal with the quantities of pollution that have been emitted and so what you see in this diagram for example is a dramatic loss right we say if we go into the red zone this area is considered um, to be the area beyond of, um, of high uncertainty. And you can see that the, the loss of genetic diversity that's occurred with all species. And what is shaded are those that have been influenced by agriculture. So agriculture has had a huge influence in the loss of, of genetic diversity. We also know, it, we see this in terms of phosphorus um, contamination and nitrogen uh, contamination, particularly in waterways and um, and run off into soils. There's a whole number of other issues that um, are not even directly addressed here. So an example of nitrate contamination has been have the high flows of fertilizers running um, from farms and, far and pasture areas, feedlots into streams, flowing down into lakes and rivers, and, those, and, and the nitrogen spawning bacterial, um, rapid bacterial growth Right, and then through a process of eutr eutrophication, this bacterial growth um, absorbing the uh, biologically available oxygen in the water 
and really killing the uh, many of the fish and, and the aquatic life in these areas. So another um, framework for analyzing sort of the overall impact of our food systems has been this one that looks on the top sort of minimum goals for 2050, right? Real food production, which means kind of edible food production, uh, total agricultural production, resilience of the food system, and these critical food security goals in terms of food distribution access below where they would need to be for 2050. And on the other hand, um, on the bottom side here, the environmental goals were exceeding um, the limits of what we think would be a safe um, level of water contamination or unsustainable water withdrawals from the aquifers, biodiversity loss, or, or the greenhouse gas emissions. All this is suggesting the need for a broader transformation of our food systems. Um, a key piece is the, that I wanna focus on is a question of food insecurity, right? And we know in terms of the most recent United Nations report that in 2019, there was about 690 million people that were food insecure um, and about 2 billion that lacked um, uh, sufficient dietary diversity. And yet, as the World Food Program notes, just winner, recent winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, there's enough food to feed everyone in the world today, right? And you know, we won't wanna spend too much on these stats on hunger uh, and despair at these moments, but it's important to recognize, right? Every 10 seconds, a child dies from the effects of hunger. Every 10 seconds, right? 690 million people going hungry, 2 billion suffering from malnutrition but there is enough food to feed all, right? And we might be important to distinguish between different types of hunger from the acute hunger. Uh, it's more of the famine type conditions where people are going to bed hungry multiple days without um, access sometimes to sufficient food, chronic or reoccurring hunger, and the hidden hunger of those 2 billion uh, that are, are malnourished, lacking sufficient uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, vitamin A, iron, or other types of deficiencies. And all this in the context of food should be considered a basic human right. Um, it's widely recognized in many countries and, um, and international bodies around the world. And we know many of the food insecure in this, in this paradox of the in injustices in our food system are actually farmers and food workers themselves. Uh, another 20% can be urban, impoverished urban population members. No question that COVID-19 is exacerbating hunger a recent report from the World Food Program anticipates that acute hunger in particular, the most severe type could double by the end of 2020. Um, and yet if we step back, we, you know, many of us love to work in, in the food system because it had, touches so many aspects of our life, right? It's a diagram from the Oxford, um, Oxford University's uh, Future um, Scenarios Program. And it's looking at some of the key components that food touches on, right? from people and the food security and the power issues here to the planetary impacts that we were talking about, right? Um, down to this question of ethics, morals, and values and justice, right? Th there's so many, there's religious beliefs and taboos related to food. There's animal ethics that play into this, right? There's questions of justice and distribution. So the food system and the agricultural systems offer this um, incredible, challenge uh, for us to address in the coming years. And some people have been really helping, helping us think about addressing this challenge include the um, International Panel of Food System Experts. And they came up with a report in 2016 called From Uniformity to Diversity, Going Back the Other Way, right? Laying out the challenge and the data here as we've just been talking about, but also recognizing there are these diversities in the food systems, right? From these farmers markets kind of displays you may, many may have seen. This is one I'm very familiar with in Northern Nicaragua, right? The, the sort of diverse landscape of smallholders uh, here, they might be growing a home garden near their house and have some fruit trees planted, a mixed field in the foreground with corn and beans that are ready to harvest. Along the edges, there's not like a a big metal fence, but there's trees that are used for a living fence. And then up here in the, t in the mountain areas, there could be coffee, shade coffee, sort of blending into a native forest territory. And yet, I think we need to, with all of these challenges and all these possibilities, remember I said, and, 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 and the scientists have demonstrated this again and again, there is enough food to feed everybody in the world. 
And in surveys, right, this is a, some, some data from um, Bread for the World taken from a, a, a study by the Center on Poverty and Social Policy in 2018. They're pulling together some data. Our generation could end hunger. That was the question asked in 1967. 25% believed it was true. In 2017, 14%. Worldwide, the numbers are, have gone down even more dramatically. People are losing their sense of hope in, in, in too many ways. And yet we know that abundance is around us if we but recognized our interconnectivity. And I think it might help to, and as I was re reading through some of the literature to, to connect this to the theme for our, for our conference, um, to think, to remember one of my favorite quotes from Kirpal Singh is that we are all drops in this ocean of all consciousness. Each of us is a drop in the ocean of all consciousness. And this, this idea might help us realize some of our interconnectivities, right? And going to thinking about um, let out to see, and here I'm borrowing from some of the interpretations of Brian Catelli, uh, uh, a scholar actually uh, in the business school at Santa Clara University, who wrote a very interesting article on Laudato Si and, and a spirituality of resilience. And he talked about Laudato Si um, as, as and, I, and I've definitely seen this through my own readings, you know, as, as reminding us that nature is a gift from God and that there should be gratitude and beauty um, should be celebrated, right? It calls also for a rejection of a consumerist throwaway culture, right? That privacies, prioritizes and privileges short-term private interests over the long-term common good. And finally, this calls us to reconcile ourselves with ourselves for first, with others and with creation itself, right? And, and, and in this article, um, Barcelli goes on to talk about a sort of spirituality of, the pres of presence, right? And of recognizing this interconnectedness, right? And, and moving towards a understanding um, that could also be prophetic. And by prophetic, I, my interpretation, and I'm looking forward to the dialogues that will follow and learning more, is not only um, understanding the current circumstances in which we're in and, and the potential futures, but also having the humility to recognize um, the mistakes that we have made and the possibility for choosing alternative pathways, right? And, and changing course. Um, so we'll come back to that if we get a chance in the dialogue. I thought I would like to now go into two case studies that explain our own uh, experience and our own efforts, imperfect as they are, um, in trying to address some of these challenges. I will start with a, a brief uh, video clip that kind of takes you to northern Nicaragua, where I originally went as a Peace Corps volunteer, um, and talks about a long-term partnership with a, a smallholder cooperative there. periodo que es difícil aquí, ya es de abril, abril, mayo, julio, julio, agosto, donde no se tiene alimento en el momento, debido a la situación de lluvia, como en esos momentos no hay lluvia. En el 2012 fue la afectación directa de la, de la plaga de la, de la ROI. iniciativa que se trabaja en alianza con la red de agroecología comunitaria, CAN, con investigadores, agroecólogos de la universidad y PRODECOP como central, trabajando en los tres departamentos, Madrid, Nueva Segovia y Estelí, en los cuatro pilares de la seguridad alimentaria. Entonces, el enfoque de agroecología e investigación acción vincularon para informar esta iniciativa. El CIES de NIC monitoreaban todas estas accionarias para ver de qué manera influían en la disponibilidad de alimentos en los tiempos de escasez. Los materiales que se han producido ha sido la guía de buenas prácticas. Eh, como acción, lo que estamos haciendo nosotros primeramente es hablando, eh, haciendo la diversificación de cultivos en nuestras áreas. El CADA es un centro de acopio y distribución de alimentos. Más que todo, un intercambio de productos, por lo menos el que tiene 
el ayote, el pipián, por lo menos, o papa, ya se traen algún tipo de producto, el arroz, el aceite, que no se cultive en la zona. Otra de las, de las iniciativas que usted está haciendo es como la, eh, un, banco, un banco de semillas, para donde nosotros podemos garantizar la semilla de nosotros, como pequeños productores. Todavía nos falta mucho que hacer, ¿verdad? Para, para seguir apoyando a productores, a familias. So hopefully that video gives you a little flavor of um, the type of work that we've been engaged with over these years. And I want to continue here with our next um, slide. And now I want to take you briefly through a case study of, from some National Science Fund um, funded research. Whoopsie. That was uh, addressing the uh, this challenge of climate change. Um, and food security with smallholders in this northern part of Nicaragua. And I start here with just noting that um, in the circumstances, the climate justice question that we're looking at here is that, you know, the average smallholder farmer in Nicaragua or Honduras or El Salvador for that matter, they in their, in a year, they'll produce about a 30th of the, or 20th at, the, uh, at most of the environmental footprint that the average North American or Canadian citizen would produce, right? And if you look at the historic trends and the cumulative emissions that have come from uh, individuals and also the fossil fuel companies in the, in the northern countries of the United States and Europe versus uh, the countries in the tropics and the global south or the majority world as my colleague Jai Chappell likes to call them, we know that these are the, the, the smallholder communities, the indigenous communities, the societies that are produced uh, the least emissions and yet, many of these farmers, uh, um, land, uh, uh, landless workers, and others are on the front lines and the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, right? And so this is a climate justice question. Um, and so, but we need to get to the specifics if we want to try to build resilience under these circumstances. In this uh, map of Central America that you see here, What's marked in, in, uh, in the sort of gold color is the Central American dry corridor, which is particularly arid and vulnerable to uh, increasingly severe droughts um, and heat waves associated with climatic change. Here we're interested though, in what is the relationship between household food and water security and how important are these climate related drivers of food and water security versus other hazards that these, far these farmers face? Um, we won this uh, grant in, in part uh, from the National Science Foundation because we didn't have a good set of indicators to simultaneously measure food and water security within the households, even though we knew they were related. Moving forward, we quickly realized through life in these communities and, and interviews and work that, you know, climate change is not the only hazard that people are facing, right? There's hurricanes, which could be um, in increasingly severe due to climate change. There was the coffee rust outbreak, as many of these farmers were growing coffee that we're working with here. Uh, plant pathogen, not too closely connected with climatic change, but a dramatic impacts on their key source of income. Um, there's droughts. Uh, there's prices, uh, rapid price changes in, in, in food costs and agricultural costs. And there's also been political uprisings uh, and political unrest, right? So one of the approaches that we bring to this work is agroecology, which is about 
redesigning food systems from the farm to the table, right, to achieve sustainability. And it really is based on a transdisciplinary partnership that recognizes the different forms of knowledge and contributions from both scientific uh, indigenous community members, the practice of farmers themselves. And it's been taken up not only as a, a, a rapidly expanding and evolving uh, academic field of science and, and inquiry, but also as a practice among urban and rural farmers and increasingly a social movement demand for a deeper change within our farming and food systems. The work that I'm talking about here is these three departments in the northern part of Nicaragua. We came together and we applied a, a, a broad set of methods, but a key piece of the research I want to tell you about were surveys conducted among um, over 311 households. We were able to match 311 households uh, from two and, and one survey in 2014 and another in 2017, and also done multiple interviews and on-farm monitoring activities and more. So what are some high level sort of top of mind findings I'd like to share with you? One is that food and water security exhibit strong seasonal patterns. And so the seasonality is important and it's linked to um, agricultural prices and production and rainfall. Second, there was a decrease in reported food and water insecurity between 2014 and 2017. And some of the farmers and focus groups attributed this to an improvement on the ending of a drought. Central America lived through a very severe drought from 2014 to 2016, which may also be um, related to increased food security challenges, even migration in some cases. Across households, we did see a strong relationship between food and water security, even when adjusting for key intermediate variables such as wealth and income. And here I'd like to give a shout out to my colleague and collaborator, Bill Sunstrom, who's a great economist and helped us run some of the multiple statistical models to come up with this. Also across households, we saw that food security correlated with measures of income and wealth and adaptive capacity on the farms, right? Especially the farmers that were growing food, such as corn and beans and not only coffee. And finally, that smallholders frequently identify coffee rust, drought and exchange entitlement shifts. And by exchange entitlement shifts, I mean the farmers getting unfair deals, right? For their, for their they're basically, everybody says you should buy low and sell high. Well, when you don't have a lot of power, um, or, or access to capital, these farmers end up selling low and when they need to buy food back for during those critical lean months of June, July and August, right? That, that food is at a high price. And so I'll just show you two figures right here. In blue, you see these, um, or in orange, you see the classic food insecure months of June, July and August. And what we added to this are these lean water months of particularly March and April. And so while many people were focusing just on three months of relative um, seasonal hunger, if we combine that with water scarcity, we're talking about five months of resource scarcity, which does kind of coincide with the, with, the, um, with the precipitation patterns, which have this classic dip in the same period of July, we see there on the right. Moving along, and um, here is just a very simplified version, in case I'm getting too academically uh, complex here, is getting enough food and water at home when there are many problems. Um, so there, are multiple challenges that these producers are facing. Some of them are natural and climatic hazards. Other ones are challenges with the terms of trade, trade and others can be agricultural hazards. So they are living in a multi, multiple hazard, multi-hazard environment. And we did see that, um, that cl although climate variability is significant, it, other hazards and fluctuations in these prices were at least as important, including the rapid spike in bean prices that happened in 2014. Follow-up studies supported by the Agropolis Foundation that you see here actually found another way to deal with those 2 billion people that have, are not eating enough dietary diversity. We realized, perhaps not surprisingly, but it's important to look at the evidence here is that farms that had higher levels of farm diversity, as we see in this farm diversity index, also reported eating more diverse diets within their household. So diversifying farmers, uh, farms is an important strategy to address this challenge. Smallholders also express their perspectives about terms like agroecology and food sovereignty um, in interviews and focus groups, as you see from one of my inspirations here, um, Melvin Pérez, is a leading farmer in Northern Nicaragua. And we spent a lot of time exchanging and sharing our perspectives and values across these different communities, right? So this is a, an exchange that brought researchers from universities in Nicaragua and Mexico and University of Vermont and Santa Clara together with co-op leaders from both countries and uh, agricultural extension agents. 
Moving now quickly to another case study, I want to talk to you about uh, what I consider a, a new project we're just getting started with, was a response to COVID-related hunger here in Northern California, right? And we know food insecurity in the U.S. is back top of mind, right? We saw since April of 2020, this just spike, you know, mothers with children over 40% in that month of April uh, reporting uh, high levels of food insecurity. And of course, there's racial and ethnic um, disparities in who's facing the hunger. Here's an interesting response. Instead of relying on the dominant sort of um, food system and the large scale um, distribution networks, a group of nonprofits in, in, in the Bay Area came together to propose an alternative that linked uh, local farmers that had lost their market share because the restaurants were shut down by, due to important public health uh, policies uh, and distribute some of the best high quality produce uh, to low income residents through nonprofit organizations doing urban justice work. It's really interesting. And they were able to at one time move um, over 600,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables and they reached over 14,000 families a week. Right, and so I've been I've been invited to come in and do a participatory assessment of this work, and here we're talking about um, analyzing the food security impacts of these box recipients, the economic security, and the trust relationships that were built among these farmers, and any kind of environmental impacts associated with changes in diets or changes in farming practices, um, and really looking at this as a potential model to contribute um, a, a more. A, of what a local food system can do in, in providing emergency food aid, right? Uh, usually it's reliant on these broad commodity programs pulling food from all across the United States or sometimes around the world. Also important, but I think there's a very important, potentially a very important role for these local responses that could also be generate more economic benefits for, for local and regional farmers and perhaps a, a stronger sense of ju justice and connectivity among eaters and rural residents. So we're excited about this project. I encourage you to look at uh, Fresh Approaches website. They're the sort of lead organization in this, partnering with Pi Ranch. We're coming in as a collaborator uh, to help do a participatory evaluation of this effort. This was part of a much larger program, which is currently playing out across the United States um, on the Farm Fresh Food Relief model in the context of the USDA's Farmers to Families program. This program has spent billions of dollars Every single one of these boxes they mandate includes a letter from uh, President Trump. So it's an interesting sort of political moment. Um, but it's also part, primarily designed to address these food security questions. Unfortunately, the USDA contract that was over you know, a million and a half dollars that supported this program for the first uh, couple, couple of months in, in this month of October was recently terminated when they changed their policy to require pounds of cooked meat in every single box lowered the, the price that they were paying for the box and essentially moved, redirected the funds to the largest distributors like Cisco Systems and UNFI that are distributing massive quantities through food banks in a much more distant food system. So we'll have to see, you know, what are the sort of strengths and weaknesses of this model, but I do think it holds potential. I wanna take the last couple of minutes here to speak a little bit about our broader kind of community-based research approach and some principles of engagement, of building power with and not over, respecting and learning from our differences, co-producing knowledge and foregrounding the voices of our partners in the frontline communities, right? And, and we argue like key professors such as Rachel Morella Frosch from UC Berkeley has argued that this type of community-based participatory research actually incre increases the relevance because we're answering questions that are proposed by our partners. It's more rigorous because we think it take multiple perspectives into our research design. And it has a further reach because it's designing, uh, collecting evidence and data that is relevant um, and, and can be used not only by the academics, but by social movement leaders and, and, and partners in this work. So what are some potential avenues for your own engagement in these efforts? Well, maybe home gardening and farmers markets. You know, many people are probably doing that, but what are the next steps that come from there? Didn't get a lot of chance to talk about this, but the evidence is very strong. And back in the first part of the presentation, when I was describing the impacts of um, when I was describing the impacts of dietary of, of food systems, study after study has shown that moving towards a plant-rich diet or entirely plant-based diets have significant impacts in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, food systems need to change and within the, 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 we need to start to get at the conditions that create 
the inequality and the hunger within food systems themselves, right? That's gonna require often political shifts and policy, right? And advocation for deeper changes to our food system. So voting and, and democracy is voting and it's more than voting, right? It's these other forms of engagement, right? And hopefully new types of partnerships that go from the farm to the fork or across our communities and our institutions and learning more about agroecology as a potentially transformative uh, um, approach to addressing and leading agricultural and food system transformations. In our own uh, university here at Santa Clara, in response to these challenges and the potential we see, we have launched an environmental justice and common good initiative. I encourage you to check out the website to learn more about it. And through this, I've been talking quite a bit about one part of the uh, program, the food justice program. We also have programs in water justice, climate justice, and law and advocacy. And we are looking for how we can build this out through a series of networks, um, not just across Santa Clara, but potentially, especially across Jesuit universities and the Catholic, broader Catholic and multi-faith communities. And we see here an incredible potential for leveraging faith-based and secular motivated work for justice to address injustices and in these multiple places, including the food system. So I wanna thank you for your time and I'll be around here answering questions as we wrap up. Have a great evening, take care.